I think the best part of that little, that offertory piece was our little worshiper back there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's great. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, this little video you saw, which we'll build on each week now as we come toward the end of our series called Jesus is Greater. Uh, it's a study of Hebrews, and if you've been with us, you know the whole theme of the first three quarters of the book is the greatness of Jesus, the greatest person who has ever, is living now, or will ever live, greater than the angels, than the universe, greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than the law, greater than the prophets, greater than the sacrificial system, greater than the high priest, greater than the temple. Jesus is greater. And then last week we saw there's this kind of this turn that happens in chapter 10 and following where the, the author of Hebrews basically says, okay, so what? So Jesus is greater, so what does that mean for your life? How should you live in light of the greatness of Jesus? And living by faith is the theme. In fact, it's the metaphor of a race, which we'll see next week. When I was a camp counselor many years ago uh, at Kennecott Christian Camps in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, just out of college, we had these things called faith poles and faith falls and faith walks. The faith pole was a telephone pole, 20 feet and 40 feet high. And you had to climb up the pole. You're roped in, of course, with the safety harness and, and, and so on. And you climb up the pole, and then you had to get your feet on top of the pole. It's just a telephone pole. Stand there and then jump out to a suspended trapeze some distance away and try to grab it. I know. And if you're a, and if you're a counselor, you have to do everything that the students and the campers will do. I, I'm, a, I'm a fairly courageous guy. Most things don't scare me, but that was a little unnerving. My feet barely fit on top of that pole. And it's remarkable how much that thing moves when you're up there. <laughs> my knees were shaking and trembling. I could hardly get myself to stand up and to jump out. And then we did faith falls. You know what that is, right? You stand on a, on a, on a ledge, on an edge, and you back, turn back like this, and you cross your arms, and then you have a group of people that have their arms locked there, and then you just decide to fall back. And don't do this. Stay straight. And they catch you in their arms. Have you done this before or seen it done? Faith fall. And then a faith walk was blindfolded across a balance beam. People are keeping you there. I just, and I began to wonder, like, why do we call all these risky, dangerous behaviors faith things? Why, what are we teaching kids here? In fact, the word faith is one of those words that's used so frequently in our culture and in so many different ways and contexts that I think it's in danger of losing its meaning from a biblical perspective. That's true in, inside and outside of the broader church culture. In his book, The God Delusion, a leading new atheist, Richard Dawkins, writes, faith, he defines faith this way, it's obstinate belief despite a lack of evidence and even in the face of evidence to the contrary. That's how Richard Dawkins, a leading new atheist, if you don't know what the new atheists are, he's, they're more aggressive, I guess, uh, a new atheist writing about what faith is. Faith, he says, is it's belief, an obstinate belief in the face of lack of evidence and even in the face of evidence to the contrary. That's not an uncommon view in our culture, so-called blind faith. Interestingly, Alistair McGrath, in his appropriately titled book, The Dawkins God, demonstrates convincingly that Dawkins' definition of faith is not one shared by any major denomination or period of Christian history. We were talking about this recently on our staff, and Andrew Griffiths, he's the guy with the funny accent, if you don't know, he shared with me a video he'd seen recently about a debate between a leading atheist uh, blogger, uh, author, scholar, and a uh, Christian apologist. And the Christian apologist was trying to make the case that you have faith too, it's just not in the same things that I have. Your faith isn't in God, it's in science and the scientific process. Your faith is in materialistic rationalism. And the atheist said, I don't have faith, I have confidence that those things are true. And the Christian apologist stood up there and in a stroke of brilliance said, you don't have faith, you have confidence. Confidence. Con fide, from the Latin, with faith. <laughs> like the ultimate mic drop in a debate right there, right? The point is that we human beings we're believing beings. We, have, we put faith in things without even calling it that or thinking about them that way. It's just part of who we are. We can't help it. It's sort of baked into who we are to believe. The Bible talks about faith in a variety of ways, of course. What is biblical faith? 
We're told in 2 Corinthians 5, we walk by faith. We're told in Romans 1, we live by faith. We're told in Romans 3, we are justified by faith. We're told in Ephesians 2, we're saved by grace through faith. We're to keep the faith, 2 Timothy 4 tells us. We have the shield of faith, Ephesians 6 says. We're to pray for more faith, Luke 17 tells us. And in 1 Timothy 6, we are to pursue faith. Is that clear up for you? What is the biblical definition of faith? Well, I'm very glad that you asked because the Bible actually tells us. And you heard it read a moment ago by Pastor Bob. That was his voice, by the way, his soothing voice reading the scripture for us. If you have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read the first three verses here. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's a very famous passage in a very famous chapter. Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame, because the rest of the chapter is these little case studies, little vignettes of people who lived by faith. Right at the beginning here of this chapter, we get these three verses, really one verse that clearly gives us a brief but very important definition of faith. Let's talk about what faith is. Now, chapter 10 of Hebrews 11 ends with some warnings about persecution to come, about struggle, about hardship. It's urging those early Christians, and by the way, if you haven't been with us, maybe you need to be reminded that Hebrews is a letter written to Christ followers in the first century who grew up Jewish. They grew up as Hebrews. They've converted to faith in Jesus, and life is getting difficult, particularly because of their faith in Christ. And they're wondering if it's worth it to hang on. In verse 39 of Hebrews chapter 10, the last verse of that chapter, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Many Christians think of faith as something you conjure up, something you muster up when times are hard. Like, you just have to have faith. I remember seeing an old movie called Nuns on the Run. I don't recommend it for theology, but it's funny. <laughs> These two bank robbers hide in a convent to a, to, and pose as nuns who are th uh, there to teach about the Trinity. But neither one of them has any idea what the Trinity is. One grew up Catholic, and they're having this discussion in this little room in this convent, and the one robber says to the other, so, so explain the Trinity to me. He goes, it's like three leaves, but one leaf, my old priest used to say. Right? And he goes on and he gives this convoluted description. He says, the, the father is his son, but he's also a dove, and he moonlights as a spirit. And the other guy goes, well, does what I'm saying make any sense to you? And the first actor says, no, but it makes no sense to anybody. That's why you have to believe it. That's why you have to have faith. <laughs> and right at that moment, a cross falls off the wall and hits him in the head. <laughs> People think of faith this way. Like, it doesn't have to make sense, but you just have to believe it. You have to muster it up. You have to conjure it somehow and just convince yourself against all odds. That's not at all what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 is saying to us. As if faith is already inside of you and you just have to find it and bring it out. Faith is not a feeling you tap into. And it's certainly not irrational. Let me read verse 1 again. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Two important Greek words here in this verse. Leave that verse up there for one minute. The first word is the word for assurance and then the word conviction. I want you to pay attention to those two words. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The first Greek word is the word upostasis. This means support, steady foundation. It's used to describe the great pillars holding up the roof of the temple or those, the Parthenon, so it's that kind of thing. Support structure, in other words. So when, it's, when Hebrews 11 one says faith is the assurance, it's the support, it's the foundation, it's the strength, the steadiness of things hoped for. And the second Greek word is the word elenkos. This is proof based on evidence, is what the word means. So let me read this verse again to you. Faith is the foundation and strength of things hoped for. And the proof based on evidence of things not seen. Sounds a little different, doesn't it, than something we muster up from inside, something we conjure, something we produce in and of ourselves. It's a strong confidence based on evidence. 
This is why the writer of Hebrews in verse 3 goes on to say that this is by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God and that what is seen is made of things that are not, not made of things that are visible. In other words, the, the visible material universe did not come into being from visible material stuff. It came into being by the word of God. Well, how did that happen? I, a couple weeks ago, was at a conference called the Center for Pastor Theologians Conference. In the church world, there's different, two different kinds of conferences. There's church leadership conferences, which are high production, lots of lights and sound and, and booths and fun and excitement. And then there's theology conferences, which are, you know, nerdy eggheads reading papers to each other. This is supposed to be something in the middle. And it, the theme this year was on scripture and science, friends or foes. One of the keynote addresses was by a woman named Deb Harzma. Deb is, has her PhD in astrophysics from um, uh, MIT. So she's kind of a smarty pants. And she's the president of BioLogos. If you don't know what BioLogos is, Francis Collins, who wrote The Language of God, he started BioLogos. It's a group of believing scientists in the world um, trying to marry science and faith, and, and it, they're really doing some remarkable work. Now, if you're a young earth creationist, you might not like them so much, but we all believe in Jesus, so let's get along. Anyway, what she says is that uh, she led us through this uh, explanation of the universe. Galaxy clusters, rate of expansion, uh, dark matter, dark energy, stuff I couldn't understand but was fascinated by. And we finished with worship. And it was brilliantly done. And her whole point was Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that all this did not come into existence out of stuff that was already there. What's the first cause? Where did it all come from? By the word of God. Faith, by means of reason, she said, faith is by means of reason perceives that the natural material world does not make sense all by itself. There must be an unseen reality behind it all. Her point is the further into astrophysics and study of quantum mechanics that she gets, the more convinced she is that this material world is not all there is. So faith is not irrational. How can you evaluate something, whether it's good or bad? Let's say you had a toaster, a very nice toaster, a great toaster, your favorite toaster. How do you know if it's a good toaster or a bad toaster? How do you evaluate if this toaster is good? Well, you couldn't say this is a bad toaster because it won't open my garage door. That would make no sense, right? It's not made to do that. The point is simple. You evaluate the toaster based on what it's made to do. How well does it toast the bread? Does it burn them all the time? Does it short out? Does it do what it's made to do? This is, we understand this in the material world. We evaluate things based on their function, their purpose. How do you know if a human being is good or bad, living rightly or wrongly? How do, you, how do we make those judgments and qualifications? You can't even begin to have that conversation unless you understand the purpose. How do you know if the universe, how do you evaluate the universe or anything? You have to understand its purpose, that for which it was made. But if this world, this material world, is all that there is, how can we talk about purpose? How can you have a discussion about what the purpose of something is if all that we are is the random collocation of atoms? Let me read to you something from your friend and mine, C.S. Lewis. He just says things better than most people. It says, let us begin by supposing that nature is all that exists, and let us suppose that nothing ever has existed or ever will exist except this meaningless play of atoms in space and time. That by a series of hundredth and thousandth chances, it has regrettably produced things like you, conscious beings who now know that their own consciousness is an accidental result of the whole meaningless process and is therefore itself meaningless, though to us, alas, it feels significant. Do you hear what he's saying? You are an accident. You are a product of this meaningless, accidental, mindless, purposeless process called the universe. And even though it might feel significant to you, your rational thought, your reasoning it out, your trying to understand it all, is only the product of, product of the meaningless process, so it too is meaningless. He says, for one thing, it is only through trusting our own minds that we have come to know nature herself. If nature, when fully known, seems to teach us, that is, as science teaches us, that our own minds are chance arrangements of atoms, then there must have been some mistake. For if that were so, then the sciences themselves would be chance arrangements of atoms. 
and we should have no reason for believing in them. There is only one way to avoid this deadlock. We must go back earlier. We must simply accept that we are spiritual and rational beings at present inhabiting a somewhat irrational universe and must draw the conclusion that we are not derived from it. We are strangers here. Isn't that what Hebrews says? Strangers and wanderers? Nature is not the only thing that exists. There is another world, and that is where we come from, and that explains why we do not feel perfectly at home here. And then my favorite part, if you'll indulge me a little more. You cannot, except in the lowest animal sense, be in love with a girl if you know and keep on remembering that all the beauties of both of her person and of her character are a momentary and accidental pattern produced by the collision of atoms and your own chemistry, chemistry and physiological response to them. You may still be, you may still have a good time, but just insofar as it ever threatens to push you from cold sensuality into real warmth and enthusiasm and joy, so afar you will need to be forced to feel the hopeless disharmony between your own emotions and the universe in which you believe you live. I know that's a lot of philosophical stuff there. Here's what he's saying. When it comes to things like love, how can the universe explain that? Elsewhere, Lewis says a boy in love knows more about the universe than any ast an astrophysicist. How can he explain that? How can you understand, make sense of, of feeling of deep devotion for somebody when all that feeling is is your own chemistry, your own random response? Faith is believing, trusting, and acting on the word of God regarding things you cannot see with your material eyes. This is why verse 6 tells us that faith, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anybody who comes to him must believe that he exists. Let's look second at what faith does. So first, faith is not irrational. Faith is, is deep confidence based on reason and evidence. The rest of this chapter is basically a series of case studies, as we said, of faith example after example of what it looks like. Faith in action, in other words. This is what James tells us in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 19. He says, you show me your faith by what you say. Great, good for you. I'll show you by my, my deeds. He says, you say you believe in God. Good for you. The demons also believe in God, and they shudder. You should believe in God, but that's not enough, in other words. Faith must produce something. It must do something. In fact, when you read through chapter 11, we read these phrases, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, by faith Noah, by faith Abel, by faith all these people. What? What? Not by faith they wrote a theology book. By faith they acted. By faith they did something. They trusted God and it produced something in their life. Faith is not getting all the answers ahead of time. Look, look, look at verses 8 through 10. We don't have time to read all of these, but Abraham is called the father of our faith. In Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The first verse is amazing. By faith, Abraham was called to go, and he went, but he didn't know where he was going. That's, by faith, we act. Faith is not, God tells you how it's gonna work out, and you can do a risk assessment and decide whether or not it's worth your time to follow. That's not faith. We'd like it to be that way. Think of it this way in the life of Abraham. God comes to Abraham and says, Leave and go. And Abraham says, where? And God says, I'll tell you later. God says, I'm going to bless you and make you the father of many nations. And Abraham says, when? And God says, I'll tell you later. Then God says, I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham says, how? I'm 99. And God says, I'll tell you later. Then the son is born against all odds. And God comes to Abraham and says, Sacrifice your son, your only son who you love. And Abraham says, why? And God says, trust me, I'll tell you later. It's faith. We don't, we don't get the whole picture ahead of time. Faith is not getting the full story ahead of time. Faith is trusting the one who will work it all out and following him. Verse 10, as we read a minute ago, says he was looking forward to an, a city whose builder and designer is God. 
And then verse 19, which will not be on the screen, but I'll read it for you. Verse 19, he says, He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back, speaking of his son Isaac. Now, we don't have time to dig into every one of these figures mentioned in chapter 11, but there's one other name I think we have to mention. I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about this name. It's the name Rahab. Look at verse 31. This is the last one given as, with an example. The other names are mentioned, but the last of this line of by faith examples. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. This is Joshua chapter 2 and 3, the story of the conquest of Jericho. Spies sent in, and Rahab welcomed them. And you might remember the story. She, based on their instruction, hangs a scarlet thread out her window to let them know they were safe. Rahab stands against the entire city. Her whole culture, she alone stands against it. What do we know about Rahab? Perhaps you know a little bit about Rahab. Rahab, is told, we're told right here, was a prostitute or a harlot. She ran a little business out of her home. Rahab's a woman, obviously, and she's a pagan. She's a Gentile. She's an Amorite. <laughs> Think about this for a minute. It is not insignificant that the final name given in the by-faith examples to us is a woman, a prostitute, and a pagan Gentile. She's an outsider in every possible way in that culture. She's a gender outsider as a woman. She's an ethnic racial outsider as a Gentile. And she's a moral outsider as a prostitute. I want you to pause for a minute because you can skip right over this. And yet she's listed for you and for me as an example of faith. A pagan prostitute. Think about that for just a minute. What does that mean? Does that mean God is actually okay with prostitution? We've had it wrong all these years? No, of course not. God is not condoning prostitution or sexual immorality. What it is saying is he loves people that we would see as outsiders and you don't have to have, no matter how much of an outsider you feel like or you look like, you can still respond to God by faith. Anyone can. Trust him and respond by faith. Rahab's life shows us that faith is the opposite of going with the flow. She stands against the king, the officials, her whole culture, to trust God, who she barely knows. She only knows through rumor and these two men. And then she's listed for us. You know where else she's listed in the New Testament? A couple other places, actually, but one significant. You know where else Rahab is listed? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, in the genealogy of Jesus. Just think about that for a minute. This pagan, Amorite, prostitute woman trusts God by faith, and we read her name today, so many centuries later, as an example of faith. What does faith do? Faith's not irrational. It's belief based on evidence. What does it do? It causes you to do things that might look otherwise foolish, that might be countercultural, that might look like swimming upstream in the culture. To take a stand for traditional view of marriage, one man, one woman, for life. To give your life away to serve somebody else, to sacrifice and, and at, the, at the cost of your 401k to bless somebody else. To do things that people around you would say, why? Why? Why do that? Why say that? Why believe that? Why act that way? When there isn't a lot of evidence for why. Okay, but how, how do you live this way exactly? How? Last, what faith sees. What faith sees. Now this might seem odd to you since in Hebrews 11.1 1, we already said faith is belief when you don't see, right? It's the confidence of things not seen. But in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. What does he mean by that? How do we put these things together? Well, look at the last two verses of chapter 11 for a minute with me. Verses 39 and 40. I've always found these to be intriguing and just remarkable verses. Now, remember, this is the last two things the writer of Hebrews says after this long chapter of all these heroes of the faith. He says, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had something provided, something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Let's think about that for just a minute. 
all these heroes of the faith, which we read about and seem so distant from us, they did not receive or did not see what they were promised. But God had something better planned for you and for me so that together with us would they, the heroes of the faith, be made perfect. Think about that for a minute. I think it's tempting to read this chapter and think, well, you know, those are spiritual superheroes. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm just a regular person. But God says, I have something better planned for you. As a matter of fact, only together with your life of faith will they be perfected. What does that mean? It means your life now by faith counts. Your life now by faith counts in eternity. Those who have gone before are watching. God is certainly watching and cheering you on. We'll see that in chapter 12 in a few moments next week. We said before that faith does not mean seeing exactly how it will all work out. But this does not mean that faith is blind. John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus speaking here uh, to, to the, the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the next verse they said, Abra- you're, Abraham's been dead for centuries. How are you supposed to have seen Abraham? And then he says, I tell you the truth in verse 58. Before Abraham was born, I am. And then the Jews pick up stones to kill him. Why? Because they were very cranky. No, because he's claiming to be God, isn't he? Before Abraham was born, I am. Yahweh, I am. The sacred name of God. And by the way, you might notice in the, in the, if you ever read through the Job's Witness translation or the, or the Mormon Bible, they retranslate verse 58 from uh, I am to I have been. Because they know what he's saying there. That's a little aside. The point is, Jesus says, Abraham, your father, who you put your faith in, Father Abraham, he rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What do you mean he saw it? How could Abraham see Jesus' day? He saw it by faith. He saw it with the eyes of faith. It was what he longed for and looked for, but did not fully receive. It was, it was foretold and pictured when he offered up Isaac and the sacrifice was found in the thicket. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 as a matter of fact, actually, verses 8 and 9. Or Hebrew, yeah, excuse me. Where am I? I'm in the wrong chapter. Hebrews 2, verses 8 and 9. Putting everything in subjection under his feet, now in putting everything in subjection to him, Jesus, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Do you hear what that says? We do not yet see everything subjected to him. What does that mean? Someday Jesus will come again and reign perfectly, restore all things, redeem all things, reestablish a new heaven and a new earth reality. But we don't see that yet, do we? We see it partly. We see a lot of evidence that goes both ways. We don't see all that. But what do we see, the writer of Hebrews says? But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, but yet will one day rule all things. What does faith see? Faith sees Jesus. What do the eyes of faith see? Jesus. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, God has something better planned for you. They, those heroes of the faith in chapter 11, looked forward, having no idea how God would act, what, what the Messiah would actually be like. No one predicted death on a cross but they trusted God to do it. We look backward to the historical reality, to the actual event, something better planned for us, so that together with us, would they be made perfect. What does that mean? When he returns and perfects all things. It's it's really astounding. Faith is not something I muster up or conjure up or I, I have to believe harder, I can convince myself. Faith is the evidence of things I hope for and the confidence of things I don't see. Why? Because I trust the God who sees all and knows all. How do I trust him? Because I know what he's already done in Jesus Christ at the cross and resurrection, and he will return. At present, we do not see everything, but we see him. We see Jesus. Faith is not knowing ahead of time how it's all going to work out, friends. Faith is trusting the one who will work it all out. Let me read to you from the book of 1 Peter Again, this will not be on the screen, but this puts it beautifully. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, 
So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Though you don't see him, you love him. But you do not now, now see him, you believe in him and trust him and follow him. That's faith. Your life by faith really matters. A moment ago I told you that I thought that it's tempting to read this, and I've done this for years, and just think these are examples to follow, that I should try to be more like these people, try hard to be a faithful man. It's only by seeing Jesus that that happens. It's only by trusting him. But I would say this, this life by faith is not done. The Bible is done being written, but the story by faith is not done. That's what chapter 11, verse 39 and 40 means. God had something better planned for you and for me, that together with us would they be made perfect, meaning your life now lived in faith to God. Matters, counts, and it's happening now. So I took a little stab at writing our own chapter 11 for Chapel Street Church, our own by faith. Now, this could be 200 times longer than it is. But I'll, I think you'll know some of these stories. By faith, 12 Swedish immigrants sought to become more inclusive to the people of God in the Fox Valley and founded this first Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva in 1894. And by faith, God has grown this congregation, now called Chapel Street Church, to over 4,000 members in its church family across three campuses and growing. By faith, a couple, Art and Dorothy Helwig, decided to use their retirement years to battle on the front lines of HIV-AIDS epidemic in Nigeria. And as a result, over 180,000 children were placed in loving foster homes, and more than 50 churches have been planted. By faith, a group of suburban moms not only dreamed of a church where families of children with special needs could worship and have their needs met, but launched a special needs ministry. With over 80 children served every, at every buddy break in growing weekend ministries for kids and adults with special needs. By faith, a young suburban girl named Amanda left her hometown of Batavia and devoted her life to working with boys off of the streets in Rwanda, believing that God is a father to the fatherless and welcomes the orphan. She loves these boys with the love she herself has received from her heavenly father. By faith, a man obeyed the prompting of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel with a delivery driver at our Kesslinger campus, and that driver came to share a story of deep brokenness and place his trust in Jesus Christ right there in the parking lot. By faith, Alicia relocated to a land where less than 1% of the people know Christ, taking on the spiritual plight of the people in Turkey. She settled in the very places Paul walked and preached, speaking light and grace once again into some of the darkest places by proclaiming the unchanging message of Jesus. And by faith, a group of moms with kids at Williamsburg Elementary School decided to reach beyond their own community and adopt McCleary School in Aurora. They collaborated with the principal to collect and deliver essential school supplies and maintain an ongoing relationship to bless the public school out of their love for Jesus and others. By faith, Brian and Christy Cheney exchanged the comforts of living in the States for the discomforts of living in the slums of Indonesia because they take God at his word that people have value and the gospel is true. By faith, a small group in Chapel Street Church decided to set aside a sacrificial amount of money each week and each month that would be used at some point in the future to support a family in need, although they did not know who that family would be. Little did they know that God would bring a woman who had been horribly abused and trying to reclaim her, her estranged children to our church, and, their, and that their money would be used not to, re, to get her an apartment, clothing, bedding, and bring her sons home with her five boys. By faith, a woman serving in our food pantry had a vision to start a community supper where church people and guests could fellowship together, sharing food and the love of God, and she believed that Jesus breaks down the artificial barriers that divide us, and everyone is welcome to come and eat at his table. And by the way, the next one is November 11th. By faith, Ed and Jan Kotinsky dedicated their lives to translating the word of God into a tribal language in Indonesia because they believe there's no hope apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. By faith, a group of people called Faith Baptist Church at Mill Creek, came to us and believing in faith that God could do something better with us together than we could do apart. And they're worshiping there this morning. We could go on, right? I could just list more and more and more, and I had others written down, but I figured it would take too long. And I was right. What would your, what would your by faith story be? 
if you're to be added to this list. And by the way, you are to be added to this list. Your life matters. Your life counts. Your ability to see with the eyes of faith who Jesus is and trust God enough to, to swim upstream against the cultural currents, to walk out in faith, whatever that means, that story's still being written. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. These were commended for their faith, but they did not receive what had been promised because God had something better planned for you and for me so that together with us would they be made perfect by faith. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that you're sovereign over all things and our faith is not very big sometimes, but you told us all we need is faith as small as a mustard seed. Just a little bit of trust in who you are because it's not how much we believe, but who we believe in and who we trust. You, O oh Lord, are the object of our faith. Help us to see you with our, the eyes you've given us, the eyes of faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the benediction and you're dismissed, uh, just a reminder that this is the first of the month, and if you came prepared to give to our benevolent offering, we uh, thank you for that. Those monies go to meet the needs of people in our church, in our community who are in need, and the ushers will receive that as you leave. Let me leave you again with the words of, from 1 Peter chapter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen, and go in peace.